Hello, everyone. Welcome to the last part of the African Treasury lecture series. Today, we're going to look at the um, African influence on um, the German art scene of the early part of the uh, 20th century. Now, this happened at the same time that um, the artists on the Parisian scene were, in, were influenced by African art. So the same way that the artists in Paris had access to um, an ethnographic uh, museum, the uh, Trocadero in Paris. So the uh, German um, artists did too, so, uh, such as uh, ethnographic museums in Dresden, as well as in Berlin. So we're gonna look at those who, um, or um, I've picked out a few um, paintings, my uh, favorites from the, um, that came out of the uh, De Brucker. Uh, movement, to Brooklyn meaning the bridge. So these were um, <coughs> artists mainly who had um, begun to train as architects and then um, because of the rapid uh, industrialization in such cities as Dresden, um, they kind of rejected that and um, said that they're gonna come with a new style of uh, art. And because they hadn't been academically trained, as I said, um, they, that they were um, architectural students, they saw that as a positive in that they weren't kind of, um, how can I say, they weren't um, overwhelmed by the traditions that had gone before. And the bridge um, title that they gave to their movement represented a kind of um, a connection between the past and the present. Um, leading figures were people like uh, Eric Heckel and Ernst uh, Kirchner and Max uh, Peckstein. Um, their art kind of um, motifs were things such as uh, color. Um, if we think of the uh, Fauvists, who were accused of uh, an extravagant use of uh, colour. I guess the same thing could be uh, applied to those of the De Brucker movement. There's also um, stronger outlines, um, discordant um, imagery. They were um, influenced by people like Van Gogh, um, people like Munch. Um, and I'm gonna give you an example here of uh, a work by the De Brucker. Um, this one is, Eric by Eric uh, Heckel. It's called um, Sailing Ships in, in the Harbour. And as you can see, they've got um, orange sails, uh, the pink beach. And I think uh, the Fauvists, their use of colour was more kind of lyrical. Um, the artists of the uh, De Brucker movement, I think they wanted to say something more. Um, as I said, uh, they were disappointed with the, the coming of the machine. And, um, and I think one of their reasons for their, what you might call adoption of African art was they were looking for, or they were impressed with the societies um, that weren't kind of involved in the uh, machine age. A simpler, um, a simpler life which is uh, one reason why they would go off um, into the country and paint uh, scenes, um, you know, in the fields. Um, yeah, um, bucolic scenes. They wanted to get away from the uh, city, uh, the feeling of um, alienation and loneliness and embrace um, what was there before. So the De Brucker movement uh, basically was there as a kind of a bridge between the past and uh, bringing things into the present. And I'll say one way of bringing it um, into the present was the uh, motifs that they um, adopted. So they started off in um, Dresden in 1905, and um, most of them moved to Berlin by 1911, and then the movement fell apart in um, 1913. So um, as well as the Blue Rider movement, uh, the De Brucker movement or the bridge, movement were the two main um, strands, you might say, of German expressionism. Okay, so when you think about uh, Germany, Germany had its uh, colonies, which it lost um, after the First World War, but it had uh, German 
East Africa, which was uh, Tanzania, Rwanda, Burundi. Um, in West Africa, it had uh, Cameroon and Togo. And in South Africa, it had uh, Namibia. So these were the uh, colonies that the uh, Germans uh, controlled up until the end of the First World War. So what I'm gonna do is um, show you some of the uh, art that influenced them, that, that ended up in um, German uh, museums. But before I go on, I just want to say that the three paintings that really kind of, um, that I would have on my wall from that movement in the, the first uh, decades of the 20th century from the German Expressionist movement are um, Still Life uh, with a Mask by Eric Heckel, um, um, African um, Wood Sculpture by Max Pechstein, and a Portrait of a Woman by Ernst Kirchner. So if you can find any of uh, them three uh, on, on the net, they are the three that I choose as my favorites. And as I say, I would be very proud to um, hang on my wall. Okay, let's look at some of the art that um, ended up in the German museums, especially in the ethnogra uh, Ethnographic Museum in Berlin. Okay, stalls. <clears throat> This is a stall by the uh, Nyamwezi people of uh, Tanzania. Now, when you think of stalls, um, which uh, a major item um, of prestige um, in sub-Saharan Africa, and probably the most famous one um, is probably uh, the golden stall of the um, Ashanti people. Um, Osai Tutu and Okomfi Anochi were the two co-founders of the um, Ashanti state in the early part of the uh, 17th century. And they, uh, the Ashanti basically ruled uh, all of Ghana, um, parts of neighboring um, Ivory Coast and uh, Togo until the coming of um, colonialism and the ending of the Ashanti um, kingdom as we know in the latter part of the 19th century. So the golden stool was said to have been kind of um, conjured down from the sky uh, by a comfy uh, uh, Anochi, who I said was one of the uh, co-founders of the uh, Ashanti. And it landed in the lap of Osai Tutu, which kind of signaled him as the uh, first leader of the um, Ashanti Union. And it is said that um, if the Ashanti stool ever leaves um, Ashanti land, if, if the gold stool ever uh, leaves it, then the Ashanti kingdom will fall apart. And there's the famous um, or the infamous request from the British governor um, for the golden stool. He was given um, a replica. When he got back to uh, England, he found that it was um, a, rep uh, a replica. And that kind of began the, the last war, 1900. Okay, so as I say, stools are a major um, item of uh, prestige in Africa. So this is stalls by the um, Nyamwezi. Um, you've got the, the, the front and you've got the uh, back there. Okay, the Nyamwezi, uh, one of the largest uh, ethnicities in Tanzania, uh, well known as elephant uh, hunters, which was a prestige uh, profession at the time, and they were well known as traders. They were involved with the trade that went from the uh, Swahili trade, uh, so, sorry, that went right from the Swahili coast to uh, the Congo. Um, so items that were traded across the um, Indian Ocean then were then taken into the um, hinterland and it passed through the Tanzanian um, uh, territory. Okay, so this store is actually in the Ethnographic Museum in uh, Berlin. Here's another one here. Okay, and one of the uh, motifs of the Nyamwezi stool um, is the uh, three uh, convex legs. See them there? And the three lugs which um, support them. So that's kind of the outstanding uh, motif of the nine worthy stalls. Okay. Okay. 
Okay. Cameroon. Okay, so this is mainly um, art of the Cameroon in a grasslands in um, west, in the west of the country. This is a, a Bangwa statue. So these um, are one of the people amongst the um, Bamaleke, another people, uh, another kingdom in that area is the Bamun, another one is the uh, Tikar. Okay, if I want to hear. Eden. Now this is where we start to see uh, the use of beads. When I think of the use of beads in sub-Saharan Africa, I think um, as well as the, uh, the uh, Bamun people of uh, Cameroon, I think the other people who use beads as much are the uh, Kuba of the uh, Congo. And a lot of these beads, um, some were kind of homegrown, um, so to speak, but there were others that, that, that uh, came from Europe um, from countries such as Holland, Czechoslovakia, and um, Italy. And these people favoured more the, um, the, there were the ser um, spherical beads, but there's also the um, tubular beads, which were very uh, popular. Okay, these are all courtly figures. These are all things that you'd see um, around the court. And, uh, certain uh, public um, ceremonies. Okay. So you through, uh, through them again. I mean, I must have taken a lot of work you know, kind of a full figure like that. But what a stunning piece of art. Okay. Another uh, people whose uh, art was um, popular amongst um, everyone were the Fang who came from uh, Cameroon, uh, Gabon, and Equatorial uh, Guinea. Um, out of all the artwork that was uh, collected um, in the early part of the 20th century, the Fang were amongst the most um, popular, uh, really. Now, when I showed you um, some Fang art in the second uh, lecture, um, I tended to focus on the um, the figures the um, figurative uh, art from the uh, Betsy and from the uh, Umvai. You might remember that the uh, Umvai had that hairstyle with the um, three crests, which they then um, um, replicated um, on their art. So what I'm going to do today is um, is uh, show you their um, their masks. Okay. Now these masks were called Ungil, N-G-I-L. And these were the judiciary masks. So they were kind of, they would come out, well, as, um, as you can see, um, the surface is, a, is a white and this was kind of um, um, enhanced by the use of a kaolin, which is um, the sacred uh, white clay, which is used throughout sub-Saharan Africa. So the Ungil mask was the judiciary mask. So this would come out at night and it would visit the houses of the wrongdoers, um, accusing them and um, punishing them for their wrongdoing against the Fang society. So no one wanted one of these um, coming to their door because it meant uh, bad news. It meant, it meant that you'd been singled out for um, punishment. So this was the uh, Ungil. And you can imagine it like coming out of the, uh, the night, this kind of white face appearing at your door. So you knew that meant trouble, okay? These were very um, um, popular. Um, if we remember that uh, Duran um, had been given one, um, he had um, 
a friend of his, um, his friend's wife had said that she doesn't want it in her house. She found it uh, horrific. Knowing he wasn't an artist and probably knowing that he was um, kind of into African art, then the friend passed it on to um, Duran. But just about everyone had some kind of fang art, whether it was a mask or um, a statuette. Um, it was one of the um, um, things that were uh, collected by people such as um, Helena Rubinstein, uh, Charles Ratton, and probably the biggest uh, collector of Fang art um, was Paul uh, Guillaume, um, one of the uh, great dealers in uh, Paris. So this is the, the Ungil mask. And as I said, you wouldn't have wanted this uh, turning up on your doorstep because uh, it meant trouble. Okay, let me show you another one. Ungil mask, N-G-I-L. As I said, Togo was a colony um, of the uh, Germans. So here we have an Ebe figure. So E W E pronounced Ebe, and you'll find them on the east coast of uh, Ghana. And this is a twin figure. So just like the um, Yoruba and other people are uh, venerated twins, so did the uh, Ebe. So um, once uh, a twin had died, then um, they would uh, commemorate, um, commemorate the uh, deceased person by sculpting a figure. Okay. And the Ebe also made their own form of um, kente cloth. Like when you think of the uh, kente cloth, we, can, uh, we tend to think of the Ashanti. But the um, Ebe um, also um, uh, produced their own form of um, kente cloth. Okay. Another people of uh, Togo called the uh, Moba. And one of the uses for this kind of figure was in um, divination. All over um, Africa, um, there have been various kinds of um, the divination process. Like the Yoruba use um, palm nuts, um, the Maasai use stones, um, the Hunguni people, um, such as the, uh, the, the, the Zuni, use bones, um, the Baole use uh, spiders. Um, the, the dog on user uh, foxes. So there's all various forms of um, divination in this country. Um, people have used things like uh, tea leaves and, and tarot cards and, and uh, such forth. So this was um, an item used in the uh, divination process amongst the mob of people of, uh, of Ghana, of uh, Togo. Okay. Okay. This is um, a reliquary uh, figure. So a reliquary is um, a, a container which is used to uh, contain items of ancestral uh, value, um, such as um, bones and, um, and such uh, relics. Now, there's a famous picture um, which I introduced in the second lecture um, called African Quartet. There's a famous uh, photograph of the Swiss sculptor um, Giacometti in his studio and on his studio there is a Cotta reliquary uh, figure. And you can see how these uh, figures um, influenced the, um, the, the uh, cubists and those who um, were into the uh, abstract. And also 
those who um, favoured a minimalist form of uh, art. So there's a Kota reliquary figure. And this was um, placed in the ethnographic, uh, ethnographic Museum in Berlin in 1887, as was this, this one here, which is um, a knife handle of the uh, Songya people in, um, in the Congo. That's iron and copper. So this is the kind of art that the um, De Brucker artists, such as Heckel and Kirchner and Peckstein would have come across while um, wandering around the Ethnogra uh, Ethnographic Museum in Berlin. Okay. The art that they were said to be very enthusiastic about was the art of uh, Benin. You can see um, some of this art in the uh, British uh, Museum. What happened in 1897, there was a punitive um, expedition. What happened is that the people of Benin, now we need to make a uh, distinction here because there's Benin, the uh, country, which was, form, which was formerly called uh, Dahomey, and there's Benin, which is a city in southwest Nigeria. And it's the Edo people, sometimes called the uh, Bini, it's the Edo people who um, populate that uh, city. And it was one of the great uh, cities of uh, brass casting and ivory work. Um, these these uh, master uh, craftsmen were um, members of guilds um, attached to the court, so especially the uh, brass casters and, uh, and the ivory workers. So what uh, happened is in uh, 1897, um, the, the Oba had um, asked the Europeans not to visit him, at a certain, not, not to come into the um, kingdom at a certain time because they were going through a, a certain uh, ceremony. Um, this was ignored. Um, the Europeans came in and without the permission of the Oba, um, some of his subordinates had killed um, the Europeans. So in retaliation, an expedition was sent into um, Benin in 1897 and about 2,000 pieces of art were removed uh, from there. Um, a lot of it um, obviously came to uh, England. As I said, you can see uh, Benin art in the British Museum. But a lot of it was um, sold off and the Germans were said to be very enthusiastic um, buyers of the art. So I'm just gonna uh, run you through some of the uh, art that the Edo people produced. Okay. These are heads um, which were um, um, put on an ancestral uh, altars. You can see the kind of the bead work there. These were um, coral beads, which you can see the, uh, the uh, collar there. Um, the uh, covering over the uh, head. These were made of red uh, coral beads, which was another um, prestige uh, item. And these were, as I say, cast from brass. They're often called bronze, but it, um, the material actually used was brass. Okay. Okay. And on this one, you can see uh, around the neck of the figure are um, leopard's teeth, which singles him out as a hunter. Okay. I mean, that was a high level of uh, com uh, competence to be able to cast something with that amount of detail. And the uh, leopard was one of the uh, royal uh, motifs. So on a lot of the, um, 
the uh, Benin art, you'll see a, um, a leopard uh, depicted. One here. This is said to be uh, an Oba king leading um, his forces out to war. And here you can see him taking um, an enemy um, prisoner. And above here, you can see uh, musicians. The one in the middle is blowing um, a side blown horn. These were carved. These were carved from ivory, and we shall look at some in a minute. Isn't that great? To be able to cast to that kind of level of um, intricacy. Okay. These are the side blown horns. Okay, back to the brass casting. This is a bell. These were um, put on shrines, alerting people to the um, offerings that have been left on the shrines. It's one of my uh, favorites, a musician um, with a side blown horn. And uh, the Benin art was um, influenced by the um, Yoruba art. I mean, even the uh, kingdom has its uh, founding with um, uh, a Yoruba prince, Oranmian, who was uh, a son of uh, Odudua. And remember, uh, uh, Odudua was the um, was the uh, creator was the creator figure amongst the um, Yoruba. He is he is the one who is said to um, come down on a chain from um, from heaven and with the use of a cock um, and some earth had uh, created land. So it came down on a chain, um, spread some uh, earth um, on the waters and the, uh, and the chicken scratched around and kind of um, disseminated the, the earth here and there and, and that's how land uh, began. So it's said to be a son of um, a Duduwa called uh, Oran Mian who was a founding figure of uh, Benin. Here is the uh, red coral. Remember I mentioned um, um, earlier when I showed you the, the head, um, uh, the head covering and, and the high collar. This is the red, this is the red coral beads I'm uh, talking about. This is in the shape of, um, so this is of um, obviously just a ceremonial uh, item, but that's in the fashion of a, a fly whisk. Obviously the hats would have been larger, but these are the um, red coral bees, which is such a, um, a prestige item amongst, amongst the uh, people of Benin. Okay. With some uh, ivory. This is one of the iconic figures or one of the um, iconic um, items in the art world of the of the Bini. And a cast was made of this and was used as the kind of poster of one of the uh, major um, cultural uh, festivals in the late 70s. It's said to be based on Queen Idia, who was the first um, Iyoba. Iyoba was a title given to the Queen Mother, uh, one of the um, important roles in the Benin society. So Queen uh, Idia. So it, it, um, it was her son, Oba Esigi, who created the role of uh, Eyoba, making his mum the first uh, queen mother. And that's nice because that just gives you a larger or an enlarged version of what is there on the crown of her head.
leopard, one of the royal uh, symbols. The eyes are made from uh, mirrors and the, the black markings are uh, copper, or copper plating. And these would have um, stood uh, next to the oba during certain public ceremonies. I say the, um, the leopard is one of the uh, motifs of Benin royalty. This here is, is, is a box. Look at the, in, uh, the intricacy of a uh, carving here. You can see why they were attached to the court and why the Oba uh, jealously uh, guarded their uh, work. Um, Beautiful. Okay. Um, some other people that were that um, influenced the um, the uh, German uh, artists, and and that they would have found uh, within their um, museums. I don't know if if um, they had the same kind of. Um, gallery uh, set up like when we think of um the french scene um daniel uh Kahn-Vela had um opened his gallery in 1907 um joseph brummer had um opened his in 1906 um charles ratton i think his was 1927 and Paul Guilherme, I think his was uh, uh, 1914. The German scene, I'm not quite sure whether they had that same kind of network of um, galleries or whether they even had um, the flea markets and the curio shops that they had in, in France. I'm not quite sure about that. One thing they had, which was, which as far as I know, the French didn't have, is that shows took place in zoos. Um, this was seen as a, as a, how can I say, an appropriate place um, for live um, displays of African dance. We hear that, um, that there was a troop from uh, Somalia and also a troop from Sudan who both performed in Germany in the early part of the 20th century. And as I said, um, it was seen um, as a relevant place for them to perform was zoos, you know, kind of, um, it was associated with the exotic. Um, so whereas American and um, other European performers would have performed in concert halls and in uh, such places, um, it was deemed appropriate that, the, um, that these Sudanese and Somalian dan dance troops should be seen in zoos. This was seen as a, a relevant scenario for them. Okay, Luba. Now we looked at the uh, Luba in the first um, lecture, um, which was called um, Serenity. And I'm going to show you them some uh, some of their artwork again because you can't get enough of the uh, of the uh, Luba. So remember the uh, the um, the lecture was called Serenity because that is the word that comes to mind when I think of their um, of their art. Other words could come to mind as well, like reflective, meditative, composed, dignified. All these words you can use. Well, I think you can use uh, when describing the Luba art. They were people that came from or, or resided in um, the southern part of what is now called the Democratic Republic of the Congo. 
There's a pipe there. What a lovely thing to um, smoke out of. I'm sure people would have uh, spent as much time looking at it as, um, as they're smoking from it. And remember that all the uh, items in the Luba art um, all depict the female form because women were seen as the um, repositories of a spirituality. The cascade hairstyle. These are headrests. So imagine if you've got uh, an elaborate hairstyle like this, you're not gonna want it uh, messed up while, uh, while you're resting or sleeping. So this is one reason why they had these uh, headrests. Caryatid, uh, caryatid. The bow stand, remember that the, um, um, the culture hero um, of the uh, Luba was Umbudi uh, Kilue and his son Kalala Ilunga is the first king of the uh, Luba. And these were hunters and blacksmiths. So that's why the uh, bow stand is uh, one of the um, most important uh, items. So this is where the uh, hunter would uh, hang his bow. One of the most um, sacred uh, items, and you can see the female figure there as well. And there were female figures called Umwadi because they were seen as the, as the uh, conduits for the return of departed kings. And they would live in the place where the king lived. Um, or, or, or where the former king had lived, and that would become a royal, a royal village. Um, and they would uh, take on the, the, all the kind of subordinates that the king had would now become, would now become under the influence of the uh, Umwadi, this, this highly respected woman who was, who was seen as the kind of the channel or the conduit for the return of the uh, departed king. Another caryatid. Umboko. Remember this was the, um, the uh, sculpture that, hold, uh, that held the uh, clay um, that was used in divination. So not only was it used in divination, but one of these would be at the entrance of the uh, king's um, residence. So as you uh, walked in, you would uh, put some of this uh, white clay um, over your head um, and over your arms as a sign of respect uh, to him. And I think, and there's, uh, um, as I said, one of my uh, favorite uh, pieces um, that came from the uh, De Brucke movement in the first part of the 20th century was a piece called um, African Wood Sculpture by Max uh, Peckstein, which shows um, various um, pieces of wood uh, sculpture. And I wonder if um, some of that sculpture was um, influenced by the uh, Luba. Yeah, uh, Lucasa, which was an um, mnemonic uh, item used by the Umbudje Society, the memory men, and they would be able to use in um, these beads uh, and these shells and these various um, items on this board. They would be able to um, track or tell the story of the uh, Luba. 
And these were the men who were, um, how, um, how can I say, they were also men of the theatre because they would also, and, 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 and during certain uh, ceremonies, they would reenact um, um, aspects of the Luba uh, epic. As you can see that from there. Just meditative. I mean, uh, if you're going to try and uh, depict um, people of respect, um, ancestors, for instance, then the way that they um, show their, um, their uh, figures is just uh, a perfect way. Another uh, caveated. Staff of office. Once again, the female figure on top. stands Numboko and amongst the uh, Belumbu royal diviners there'll be the diviner in uh, the middle to the side of him will be his wife who was his uh, assistant during the um, during, um, during the process and on the other side of him would be the uh, Umboko. Another one there. And as you see, some of them have got this shiny uh, patina because these um, items were um, anointed with things like uh, camwood um, powder, which is why some of them have that kind of reddish uh, sheen. Um, so um, there was the uh, camwood tree and they would take um, a strip of bark and in its uh, powdered form, um, especially mixed with uh, palm oil, they would uh, use it to um, anoint these uh, figures. Lovely. Now, to finish this uh, part of the uh, lecture, there's just um, something I'd uh, like to read. Um, this is called The Ancestor and the Sculptor. I sailed away today, all the way to the Congo, I sailed away with a Hemba ancestor. If I'd known you were lonely, I would have taken you too. So you could immerse yourself in the beauty that sometimes comes from wood. Transport you to where the master sculptor give thanks to the tree that will continue to bestow its eternal blessings after it has been gratefully cut down. Watch him smiling as he strides back, eager to begin. Then the meditative quality that comes over his face as chisel connects with wood, commencing the song of the ancestor that is called Singiti. You, could have, you too could have taken a pilgrimage to the shrine of the Hemba sculptor, entranced as we watch the face emerge, the visage that personifies reflection, reflection a portal to understanding, to see the master sculptor 
sitting in contented silence, paying homage to the honoured one who walked the earth before him, who sprinkled wisdom in his footprints to guide those who are coming after. When loneliness attempts to embed itself, just let me know. Today I went to the Congo, but I take regular journeys, my friend, to Ivory Coast, Nigeria, Angola, Gabon, Burkina Faso, Cameroon, and so on. Today the Congo, maybe Mali tomorrow. When you need to sail away, come and see me. Okay, for the last uh, 15 minutes, I'm going to um, give you a, a review of, um, of the uh, series because I realize that um, those attending today uh, might have missed um, some of the other uh, lectures. Okay, it was called African uh, Treasury. The first uh, lecture was called um, Serenity, which looked at the uh, sculpture of the uh, Congo. So we started with the Mangbetu, who uh, reside in the northern part of um, the present day Democratic Republic of the Congo. They are a central Sudanic uh, people. All, all of the, the other people um, that we looked at um, are people um, of, uh, of the Bantu. Okay, so um, the defining uh, motif of the Mangbetu is the Lipombo. So this was the, the, the elongated head. Now this was um, started from when the child was um, um, a little one and, uh, and the head was wrapped in cloth to give it this kind of um, elongated um, look. And this was seen as, um, yeah, as a sign of um, intelligence. Um, so all their artwork features um, figures, um, heads with these kind of um, elongated um, fixture. Um, and it was called Lipombo. And it was um, accentuated by this fan-like um, hairstyle um, uh, amongst the uh, females. And Mengbetu was actually a term which was actually given to the elite of the society originally, but then became um, um, a generic term for the people. So that is their kind of main um, recognizable uh, motif, the um, uh, Lipomba, this kind of elongated head. Okay, so going down from there, then we came across the um, Luba, who we've just um, looked at. We also looked at the uh, Lulua people, and their kind of most recognizable uh, motif is the amount of scarification that they um, depict on their, on, their, um, on their art. I think the only um, other people apart from them who probably depicted as much is the Makonde people of uh, Mozambique and um, Tanzania, and maybe the, um, the uh, Congo people of uh, the Congo and uh, uh, Angola. So this is one of the, the, the main ways that we're able to uh, distinguish the Lulua art because they've got so much um, um, depiction of um, scarification on their uh, figures. Okay, I've also, um, we've mentioned the um, Luba um, uh, already, who, who were also in the uh, southern region, and the Hemba uh, also. The uh, piece that I've just uh, written was, was about the uh, Hemba. And if I had to pick my favorite art from the Congo region, or from Central um, Africa as a whole, it would be the, it would be the, the art of the Luba and the uh, hemba. And as I said, all these words that you can use um, to um, uh, uh, describe them resonates, whether you want to use the term reflective, meditative, composed, um, dignified, serene. But that's the reason why I call their work, um, which is why I call the lecture Serenity. Okay, from uh, from Serenity, we then looked at um, African uh, Quartet. African Quartet um, 
I lose to the four artists who I see as the first to elevate African art um, from where it was seen as something of ethnographic uh, interest. And they basically took it from there and put it on the pedestal of art. And the four are De Vlamanc, Duran, uh, Picasso and Matisse. Um, as you know, um, uh, Vlamanc and Matisse were involved in the, the, the Fauvist movement. Picasso was one of the, um, um, and so was uh, Matisse. Uh, uh, Matisse was also part of the Fauvis movement. As you know, Picasso was one of the um, um, trailblazers of Cubism uh, alongside uh, Brack. So that lecture looked at, um, I tried to give um, uh, an holistic picture as possible. So we looked at um, uh, patrons, um, such as um, Helena Rubinstein, who, who I mentioned uh, earlier, um, other collectors such as uh, Jacob uh, Epstein. And as I said, there, um, there was this kind of scene where you had the uh, Chocadero uh, Museum, but you also had um, um, works of art uh, that could be found in the curio shops, in flea markets, as well as in the uh, galleries that opened in the first uh, decades of the uh, 20th century. So as the African quartet can allude to, not only to the artists, but to the four great um, dealers and um, um, collectors. And I'll mention uh, Daniel Canvela, uh, um, Joseph Brummer, um, Paul Gilliam and Charles uh, Ratton. These were the four great um, uh, collector uh, de de dealers. I mean, if I was going to be anywhere in Europe in the first part of the 20th century, I think I would have liked to have been in Paris because there I could have been introduced to uh, so much art. There's a story of, um, of Matisse who uh, bought a, a villi figure from um, a curio shop and took it to the salon of um, Gertrude Stein and uh, Picasso was there. And the story goes that um, Picasso couldn't stop looking at it all, all night and, 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 and touching it. And the story goes that he went home and he kind of was sketching them feverishly and then crashed out in the early hours of the morning. That was said to be his um, in introduction to African art. And then from there, um, like other artists, uh, he made regular visits to the um, Trocadero, which was the uh, ethnographic museum in Paris. Okay, so from then, uh, we looked at the art um, of Nigeria, the uh, Yoruba art. The lecture is called The Blessings of uh, Ife. And as I said, uh, Ife is the spiritual uh, homeland of the um, Yoruba. That's where they believe their humanity uh, began. Um, one thing I never mentioned was, um, because when we talk about um, schools of art and isms, we tend to focus on the European ones, Cubism and Impressionism. So one of the um, ones I'd like to introduce to you is, is um, Honorism. Honor is the European word, is, is, is the Yoruba word for art. And at, um, based at uh, the Ife University and in um, other places in um, Yoruba land, there began to be this um, kind of, I don't know if you call it um, a resurrection, maybe a connection with uh, traditional Yoruba uh, motifs, which were then um, brought into uh, the art, whether it was sculpture or a painting or a print work. Um, so just like in um, Igbo land, you had um, Ilu, um, which is a form of, um, which originally was a form of body um, decoration and also used on um, wall uh, murals. Um, artists such as um, Uche uh, Okeke, 
um, brought it into um, modern and um, contemporary use. But onnitism was this um, kind of movement to, um, to kind of use um, traditional Yoruba motifs in art. And as I say, um, across the whole range, um, print, um, uh, sculpture, as well as uh, painting. And another uh, thing I'd like to mention is the Oshogbo sacred uh, shrine. So in the lecture, I mentioned that uh, Father Carroll um, had been someone who had furthered the, the art of uh, Lamide Fakia, one of the great um, uh, sculptures. So another European that I'd like to mention is uh, Susanna Wegner. She kind of um, resurrected the um, Oshogbo um, shrine, which had fallen out of a disused part, uh, partly due to the coming of Christianity and the downgrading of traditional belief. Now the Oshogbo shrine was based around Oshun, who was one of the um, Orishas, one of the uh, deities. Now the, uh, the uh, Yoruba have about um, 400 odd um, deities. Uh, one of them is called Ushun, who is uh, a goddess of the rivers and of, um, fer of uh, fertility. And through the kind of the passion of uh, Susan Wegner, who came from uh, Austria, this, this um, sacred shrine was resurrected with pieces of art by, by herself and from um, um, artists um, um, in the area who, uh, who uh, all came together and decided, yeah, um, we should uh, resurrect this shrine. And this shrine, the um, uh, Ashogbo sacred shrine, has been recognized by uh, UNESCO and is now um, a cultural um, heritage site. Okay. And then uh, today we looked at um, the influence that the um, African art had on um, the German artists, especially those around the uh, De Brucke movement, which was part of the German um, expressionist uh, movement. Artists such as um, Eric Heckel, um, Ernst uh, Kirchner, and Max uh, Pechstein. Um, these were people who had, um, well, four of, four of the original founders of that movement had been um, architectural students at, at uh, a university in Dresden and, ba and basically turned their back on that and um, forged uh, careers in fine art. It's sad that towards the end of their, um, well, not uh, not towards the end of their lives, but during the during the thirties and forties, their work was seen as degenerate um, by the Nazis, and it was um, confiscated, um, which is really sad. I mean, kind of uh, imagine you know you're spending all your time. Um, painting and sculpting, and, you know, and doing these uh, uh, woodcuts, and then suddenly someone come, go, comes along and says, basically, that's that's crap, and that will no longer be exhibited in our gal in our galleries and museums, and it was, and this art was basically uh, taken away and never seen again, um, which I think is one of the uh, sad uh, chapters. But one of the uh, glorious uh, chapters is that um, so much of the art of um, Africa influenced um, uh, the artists uh, based in Paris and based in uh, Berlin. And I think that's one of the uh, greatest uh, legacies in the history of, of what we call um, civilization. That this art from the, the Congo and uh, mainly from the um, uh, Central and uh, West Africa um, basically went uh, global, uh, global and influenced um, so many people, you know, painters, sculptors, collectors, dealers, patrons. So I hope that this um, lecture uh, uh, series has opened. Um, African um, sculpture to you and I hope that um, that you will uh, uh, continue to research more and what you've learned through this series um, that you will share with your friends and uh, family and that we can all 
join in the celebration of African treasury. Thank you very much.